Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Uh, that you need. And this week we're going to start a three-week sermon series on the 23rd Psalm. I thought that this would be an appropriate uh, passage for us to concentrate on for the next couple weeks as we start off 2020. So, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this time of sharing the Holy Scriptures, we thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ, the living Word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us into all truth. So, Father, as we study these Scriptures that are a lamp unto our feet, and a light unto our path. May you illuminate the dark areas of our lives. May we seek the truth. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 23rd Psalm is very familiar to us because we're taught it from the time that we're very young. And we hear it at the time that we pass away from this world. Many times it's read at every funeral service that I've ever officiated and almost every funeral service that I've ever gone to. We recite the 23rd Psalm, whether it's the King James Version with the these and the thous, or it's the New International Version or any of the other versions in between. We recite these words. But yet, I don't know if we understand how profound these words actually are and the degree of comfort and courage that it, these words can bring about in our lives. It's important to note that before you read Psalm 23, you've got to read Psalm 22. And in Psalm 22, right, 
by the way, that's how you read the Bible. You got to read the Bible vertically and horizontally. You got to make sure to know what came right before and also how it fits into the overall context of things. So when you think about how to read the Bible, think about the cross, vertical and horizontal there. And so if you just read the 23rd Psalm, which is written by David, you think, hey, this David fella, he has it down pretty pat. He has his life pretty well together there and his relationship with God is pretty well and stable. I mean, after all, think about this beautiful psalm that he's just put together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. But if you look in Psalm 22, you'll see very familiar words. Words that we recount during the crucifixion story that Jesus cries out. Psalm 22, written by David, one chapter over. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. How many of us in our times of despair have cried out similar types of prayers? My God, my God, where are you? Why aren't you listening to me? But I'm grateful for the fact that I'm not the only person that talks to himself. David, the scriptures... The Psalms are talking to themselves. It's a conversation that we have between our minds and our hearts. It's a conversation between our faith and our feelings and what we perceive as reality. Because we might feel at times, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's okay to pray those prayers. It's not okay. God wants to hear those prayers. It says that he's close to the brokenhearted. God hears our prayers. He delights in our prayers. But it's important that our prayers don't stay there. Because that's the example of the Psalms. The prayers don't stay in the lament. But rather the prayers build themselves up. The psalmist builds himself up. So he goes in Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. How do we get from Psalm 22 to Psalm 23. That's what we're going to talk about over the next couple weeks. This is what it says in Psalm 23 in the Amplified Version. The Lord is my shepherd to feed, guide, and shield me. I shall not lack. He makes me lie down in fresh, tender, green pastures. He leads me beside the still and restful waters. He refreshes and restores my life, myself. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with him, not for my earning it, but for his namesake. I really appreciate the Amplified Bible's version of expanding upon what does it mean that God is our shepherd. But let me tell you a little bit about the, the shepherd context of which David is writing. Remember, David was a shepherd before he was a king. Before David was a shepherd before he was a warrior. But David was the least in his father's household. So it, the shepherd role was not the elevated role. The elevated role would be the warriors. Remember David as the, with the three stones and the slingshot and Goliath and all that? He's coming in from the shepherding field, and he runs up to his brothers who are the warriors. We talked about this a little bit during uh, Christmas Sunday about how we kind of exalt power. We exalt brute strength. But the message of the incarnation is that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The Word took on our weaknesses. The Word took on all of our human experience and came in the form of a baby in a manger who then died the death on a cross. He who knew no sin became the very essence of sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it says that Jesus, being equal to God, did not consider equality with God something that he had to like work after, but instead chose to make himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant, becoming obedient even unto the point of death, death on a cross, so that he would be given the name that is above every other name. That's how God works. In God's kingdom economy, 
It's not the warriors that are exalted. It's the shepherds. It's the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn their sinfulness. Blessed are those who are broken. This is who God exalts, and this is how David relates to God. David doesn't relate to God at, from the king position. He doesn't relate to God from the warrior position. He relates to God as God as shepherd, God as least among us. The shepherds were the outcasts, the least among us. Not a desirable job to be done, but a job that needed to be done nonetheless. So we need to understand the, how profound it is that David says, the Lord is my shepherd. What does it mean for God to be as our shepherd? Jesus relates to himself as the good shepherd. This is what it says in John 10, 11 through 15 in the message translation. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd puts the sheep before himself, sacrifices himself if necessary. A hired man is not a real shepherd. The sheep mean nothing to him. He sees a wolf coming and runs for it, leaving the sheep to be ravaged and scattered by the wolf. He's only in it for the money. The sheep don't matter to him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and my own sheep know me. In the same way the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I put the sheep before myself, sacrificing myself if necessary. For the shepherd, his sheep were everything. The sheep were his community. The sheep were something that he had to tend to, that he had to care for. And it wasn't that he had to do it because of the money part. Because after all, he's not saying, I'm doing this as a hired hand. I'm the good shepherd. I'm doing this because this is part of my identity. It's part of who I am. It's what we do, right? Just as we are called to be committed to one another in relationship. We're called to be committed to one another in relationship, not because we're commanded to, but because it's something what we, it's because of we, what we become. We become like the good shepherd. We become like Jesus, where we tend to the flock of one another. You, you guys have heard the story before that I never intended to be a pastor. I mean, it's been 14 years and I never wanted to be a pastor. I didn't mind preaching. Preaching is one thing. Preaching is kind of nice. I mean, I get up here, I get to tell you what I think, and then I get to go. But pastoring is a very different thing than preaching. See, sometimes people think that the pastor is what they do up here on Sunday morning, but th this is a very little part of what the pastor job is. The pastor job is really being a shepherd to this flock. And as a shepherd to the flock, this is the reason why I never wanted to be a pastor. <sighs> Have you looked at yourselves recently? <laughs> Woo! Never wanted to be a pastor because when you are a shepherd, you got to be with your flock. You got to get into the ditches with your flock. You got to help your flock. And we only do, the pastors only do this because. What did Jesus do for us? He set an example for all of us to follow. That you get into the pit with one another. I might have told you this story, but I, I love this story about the, the guy named Joe and he falls into a pit. And Joe can't get out of this pit. And a couple minutes later, after Joe tries everything to get out of the pit, uh, a preacher comes walking by. And he goes, hey, preacher man, I'm in the pit. I can't get out of the pit. And preacher man goes, hey... I'm on my way to a speaking engagement. I don't really have time to help you out of the pit. But here, I'll write out a prayer. And he throws the prayer into the pit. Now Joe's in the pit with a prayer, but he can't get out. How many of us are like that? And then, a couple minutes later, a doctor comes walking by. He goes, hey, Doc, I'm in the pit. Can you help me out? Doc goes, Joe, I wish I could help you out, but I'm on my way to surgery. I'll write you a prescription. And he throws a prescription into the pit. So now Joe has a pit, or he's in the pit with a prayer and a prescription, but he's still in the pit. A couple of minutes later, his friend Bob walks by, and Joe goes, Hey, Bob, I'm in the pit. Can you help me out? I got a prayer and I got a prescription, but I'm still stuck in the pit. And Bob goes, Sure. And he jumps into the pit. And now Joe goes, You idiot! What are you doing? You are now in the pit with me. And what Bob says to Joe is this. You see, I've been in this pit before and I know the way out. 
That's why I jumped in. That's what it means to be a good shepherd. It means we jump into pits. God jumped into the pit of our life. He continues to jump into the pits of our lives. He doesn't just offer prayers and prescriptions and scripture, random scripture passages. No, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He gets into the pit with us. Now, as we know that God is our shepherd, we also need to know that we are sheep, and sheep are not smart. Sheep are not smart. Now, this is what it says in Psalm 103. Know that the Lord, He is God. Oh, we could just have a whole sermon passage on that. Who's God? The Lord is God. You're not God. I'm not God. God is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Recognize, remember, what it means to be a sheep of his pasture. He lays down his life for his sheep. He takes care of his sheep. That's what it means. But it also comes with this recognition that sheep are not smart. In fact, sheep are so dumb, they will actually follow one another off of a cliff. Anybody been looking at a lot of sheep butts lately? You gotta make sure you know where the sheep are headed. Know where the flock is headed. Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing and gone our own way. Understand the inclination. Now, in the 23rd Psalm that we read there, it says that he leads us along right paths. Notice that the word is plural. There are multiple paths that are laid out in front of us. God wants to lead us into the best path. But many of us are just focused on the day-to-day -day routine, right? If you look at what sheep do, they eat and they poop. They eat and they poop. That's similar to our lives most of the time, right? We, we take in, we consume, and we export. How about that? But that's all we tend to do. And how many of us are just trying to make it through the daily thing of living? Just trying to make it through the next moment, next moment in time. But the problem with that is we're just focused on what's right in front of us, but we're never focused on the path that whatever is in front of us has led us to. I don't know about you, but I have been dry, I've driven places and not paid attention to where I was going and didn't realize where I was at. How many of you have gotten to a destination and have no remembrance of driving to that destination? That's scary stuff, isn't it? That's when I think I've been abducted by aliens in that moment in time, and they gave me supernatural in intellect during that moment, and then it dissipates rather quickly. But that's because we're not present in the present, and if we are heading toward a destination when we're driving a vehicle, how much more are we not paying attention to the path of our life? We're just trying to make it through the next moment, the next day. So we need a good shepherd to lead us in the path because we don't know where we're going to go and many times we'll go with the inclinations of our own hearts how many of you can make the voice of god sound very much like your own voice and right so we need that good shepherd luke 15 4 tells us about this good shepherd suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Everybody say, until he finds it. God never gives up. The good shepherd never gives up. So we as sheep, we all go astray. We as sheep, we continue to do dumb things. But God never gives up going after us. Never gives up coming to find us. Now, as a shepherd, we are cared for by this shepherd. It's so nice to know that you don't have to care for yourself. You are cared for by the shepherd. But the goal is that you have to stay by the shepherd. Because if you don't stay by the shepherd, then the shepherd has to come, follow, come after you. Now, while the shepherd may come after you and will come after you and never gives up, it doesn't mean that you won't deal with the consequences of wandering. There's always consequences. It doesn't mean... Our salvation is in jeopardy. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love us any less, but there are consequences, right? You reap what you sow. And so here's what it says, Psalm 23, 1. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I lack a lot. Anybody there? You go, oh, I don't have this, I don't have this, I don't have this. But you know what? One thing I talked to, I talked to Arlene uh, not that long ago. Remember I told you I had like a little time of sitting down and talking with Arlene? See, you didn't know it was going to turn into a sermon illustration. But Arlene was said, I grew up and we were so poor, but we didn't know that we were poor. Anybody had that same feeling when you were growing up? Didn't know that you were poor. Why didn't you know that you were poor? Because you didn't have social media. You didn't have 90 million channels on television telling you what you need, what you need to do. And how many of us have like 2,800 channels? And then we'll say, but there's nothing on the watch. <laughs> what does that tell us about our needs and our wants? That tells us something. When you get down to the basics, we had our needs met. Our needs are met. It's that we've lost sight of what are our needs and what are our wants. And sometimes our wants take us far away from what we need, right? You can have 90 million channels and still be bored out of your mind. You can have all the money that you thought that you needed and wanted and still be miserable. These things are not what we need. What is it that we need? The Bible tells us in Matthew 5, 6, this is what Jesus says in the Beatitudes. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You might be familiar with that passage. That's the same passage. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So blessed are you when you know that you, you need something. And blessed are you when you know that you need God to fill it up. And when you have an appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. So that's how the psalmist is able to say, I lack nothing. Yes, there's going to be days when my cable's going to be shut off, but I lack nothing. Yes, there may be days when my car's going to break down or I don't have a car, but I lack nothing. Why? Because I have everything in Christ. Everything that I need, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. That's what the Amplified Bible talks about in that Philippians chapter 3 passage, where it says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things when I recognize I can't do anything, but Christ can do everything through me. And so that's why the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Matthew 6, 31 through 33 You've heard me quote this passage from the NIV, the 33 part, where I tell people, this is what Jesus says. He boils it down real easy. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added unto you. The good shepherd tells us the way out of the pit. The way out of the pit is seek first the kingdom, and God takes care of the rest. But this is what it says in the message translation. What I'm trying to do here, now this is Jesus talking, and I like how it puts it in the regular vernacular here. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax. Anybody need to relax a little bit more? Okay. To not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things. But you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. I want to talk a little bit about that word steep. Because um, what does it mean to steep yourself? How many of you drink tea? All right, I drink tea uh, after I have my coffee. I have coffee and then tea later on in the day. Uh, but just to keep the... It takes a lot of caffeine to keep this going, all right? So, but the thing about tea is you got to take the tea bag. You can't just add hot water and then dip the tea bag a couple times and then throw it out and think that you're going to have good tea. How do you have good tea? You got to steep the tea bag in there. You got to, I actually read the directions of tea bags. Have any of you ever read the directions? It's interesting. There are directions on tea bags and it says, leave in for four minutes. Four minutes? I got other things to do. That's why I got a microwave, put it in for a minute, and get the hot water. But if you want the full flavor, if you want the full effect, you got to steep your, you got to steep the tea bag. Same thing in our spiritual life. If we want the full effect of what this is all about, 
You got to steep yourself in the God reality, in God's initiatives, and in what God is doing, and you got to delight yourself in Him. And this is what it says: in, delight yourself in the Lord, and then what happens? He will give you the desires of your heart. But you know what I found happens? The more I delight myself in the Lord, the more He changes the desire of my heart. As He changes the the desire of my heart. He meets the new desires because I recognize that the, 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 the desires I had before were not the correct desires. Because when you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and He's going to find a way to put you back on that path because He's a good shepherd. And as you stick by the shepherd, you start recognizing what belongs with the shepherd and what doesn't. What belongs with your God identity and what doesn't. And you recognize the things that people tell you that are going to bring you joy, that are going to bring you peace, don't actually do any of that. The only thing that does is Christ and Christ in us, the hope of glory. So we are not only cared for by the shepherd, but we are fed by the shepherd. Psalm 23, 2 says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. I... I get a kick out of this passage when you actually break it down verse by verse. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Some of you, I'm trying to just get you to get up from a pasture. <laughs> but here's the thing. Sheep will not lay down to be fed. They will not sit still enough to be fed. They will not lay down. And so what happens is the shepherd has to come along and make them lie down so that they can be fed. How many of us need to actually be told to take a real rest? How many of us need to enter into the rest of God, as it tells us in the book of Hebrews, and to stay in that Sabbath rest? We need a good shepherd that's going to make us lie down in those green pastures. And then it says, he leads me beside the quiet waters. What's the significance of that? Sheep will not drink if there's a lot of water rushing by them. So a lot of times the shepherd will create a little dam so that the water will trickle down so that the sheep will actually drink what's in front of them. Sometimes it feels in our life that we are drinking from a hose, doesn't it? Feels like there's so much coming up against us. And that's why we have a good shepherd who says, it's time to be still and know that I'm God. It's time to take a real rest. It's time to drink. It's time to eat. John 4, 14, Jesus says, But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes, becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. So the idea, by the way, isn't that we have to keep going back to the stream, but that we recognize that the stream has been within us all along. And so as we recognize that we have living water within us, we understand that that living water is not going anywhere. It's not going to get dried up. And so therefore, we are then free to pass out that living water to one another. We are then free. Don't you love people that are refreshing to your soul? Love people. I mean, how many of us really enjoy family get-togethers when you're with people that are just sucking from you all the time? <laughs> you know the people that I'm talking about. Family, friends, church folk. <sighs> But isn't it nice when somebody comes along and goes, let me water your soul a little bit. You want, you're able to water other people's souls when you recognize how much water you actually have. We're always sitting there thinking about how much I don't have. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in need. I shall not be in want. I will have ample supply to do all that God has called me to do. But notice, God gives me all the ample supply to do what he's called me to do. Not what I've decided to do on my own. God doesn't take responsibility to empower us for our own messes. He'll help us clean up the mess. But many times we run ourselves ragged because we're doing the things that we think are of, maybe of God, but we were not called by God to do those things. Revelation 7, 17, For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And what comes along with that? And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That living water produces joy and hope and peace within us. 
And then all those tears that we've shared with one another, that we've cried out in our loneliness and that we've cried out in our communities, God will wipe every tear away because we will be satisfied in Him and Him alone. C.S. Lewis said something along this line, if this world always leads you in lack, leaves you wanting more, then it's a pretty sure bet you were not designed for this world. We weren't designed for this world, but we were designed for relationship with our Heavenly Father. We are led by that shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Here's the thing about shepherds. The shepherd's going to keep his flock moving. He's going to keep you moving. See, God isn't... In the journey of faith, you're either moving forward or you're moving backwards, but you're never standing still. And some of us have been standing still too long, but the problem is, is that the train keeps on moving. The faith train keeps on moving. The shepherd wants to lead us to new places, new ground, and you go, but what if I might make a mistake? Guess what? I got, I got news for you. You're going to because you're sheep and you're dumb. I'm a sheep and I'm dumb. We're going to make mistakes, but that's where I look at Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, and I have such, such a, assurance with it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not, so trust in your good shepherd with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Because our own understanding is quite limited. And the problem is, a lot of us have knowledge that's a mile wide, but an inch deep. Just saying. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. He will direct it. That doesn't mean he's not going to say you're never going to get off path. Because you are. But when you trust in Him, when you lean not on your own understanding and you're willing to follow the shepherd, He'll get you on the right path. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord, thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil, to give you hope in your final outcome. Everybody say final outcome. Final outcome. It's hope in your final outcome. There's going to be times along the way that you're going to feel like you're losing. But Jesus says you have to be willing to lose your life in order to find your life. And you need to understand that in your final outcome, God's already said you're good. I read the back of the book, and the book says you're good. Don't worry, I skipped ahead for all of you. We are led by the shepherd's voice. You know, it's interesting, sheep follow, but they can't be driven. The, sheep, the shepherd has to be out in front of the sheep. The shepherd can't be behind the sheep trying to go it because it's like herding cats. I never knew that. But it's very interesting that the shepherd has to be behind. The first will be last and the last will be first. Jesus says in John 10, 27, the sheep that are my own hear and are listening to my voice and I know them and they follow me. And John 16, 13, in the Amplified Version, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. God is speaking to his sheep. The question is whether or not we've learned the voice of our shepherd. Whether or not we've learned, walked with the shepherd long enough to learn his voice, to hear that spirit, to know where he's guiding us. My job as a, as a sheep, you have one job. Are you ready for your job? Stick with your shepherd. Your job as a sheep is to stick with your shepherd. Your shepherd takes care of your food. Your shepherd takes care of your needs. Your shepherd takes care of everyone and will protect you. But it's our job to stick by him. So here's the question. Are we listening? Are we tuning our ears to the shepherd? Psalm 25 says this, make me, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. My friends, is that our prayer? Or do we want instant tea? Are we waiting and steeping ourselves in God's life, in God's kingdom? Are we waiting for his direction? Are we saying, Lord, teach me? Or are we too busy talking at him, not talking with him? 
not listening to our shepherd's voice, to know where the shepherd is leading us. If you feel like you're lost, your shepherd is going to find you. You are never too far beyond your shepherd's reach. He's a good shepherd. He lays down his life for his sheep. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus is our good shepherd. We thank you that nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love that you have for us. Not even ourselves can separate us from your love. Father, when the shepherd comes, help us to listen. Help us to respond. Help us to follow wherever that shepherd, our shepherd leads. Help us to recognize the voice of our shepherd, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for all of us that we would know Christ, that we would share in his sufferings so that we would also share in his resurrection glory, that we would passionately pursue him and steep our lives in your holiness, in your goodness, and your grace. May that amazing grace overtake each and every heart here today. May today be the day that we truly surrender all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional, but grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay, really.